The most important part of the Italian job were the cars, I always felt. They almost overshadowed the actors. I decided to use the Mini because it was the icon. It was what really made the 60s the 60s. René Julien was, perhaps still is, the most famous stunt driver in Europe. And if you're doing a big stunt driving film, you go for the best. They were wonderful. They were so clever with those cars, they almost turned them into people. Somehow, he managed to make his car, anything he drove or his team drove, he managed them to, to give them a personality of, the, of their own and a grace, funny enough, of their own. Remy is the greatest. Remy is, by, by a long way, the greatest of all stunt drivers, technically and imaginatively. It was Remy who, for example, went around to Rin with Michael Dealey and Peter Collinson and said, uh, saw location and said, I can do this here, do you want to put it in? Do I can do that here, do you want to put it in? And they did. To test the, the cars, uh, Remy would drive them and, and, and test them and on the road. And I, I remember dr driving home one day and I saw the Mini being tested, you know, uh, and it zipped along, overtook us, came to traffic lights, the traffic lights turned red and Somehow, Remy threw his body back, and the Mini sat up and begged with four wheels up, and then when it changed to green, he lurched forward, and the Mini dropped, and he drove off again. You know, and I thought that was quite one of the most impressive things I've ever seen in my life. His contribution was great, and in a way, this is Remy Julien's movie. The staircase shot. When I went round, I took Peter round the locations, and he saw what was taken, he said, oh, that's great. He said, that's marvellous. We'll have them come down that staircase. OK. So, so then we had to get uh, permissions. Of course, that was, a, in a very lovely old palazzo. In Italian, a, a car is a macchina. A machine is a macchina. And um, when the unit went to shoot in the palazzi, in the various palaces, in these with priceless artefacts, they said, we were coming in with a few machine. Well, machine is machine. They didn't realise there were cars, and they nearly had kittens when, when the three minis turned up, driving over their carpets, down the staircases and so on. Ah, Italian <laughs> compatriot wasn't very honest, and he didn't in so much. I don't know quite who he felt he was working for. I mean, he was pulling back handers from everybody. But in fact, he didn't really tell the shopkeepers until the very last minute that the cars are going to go down the arcades. But when they found out, well, one or two of them got very uppity and I also saw perhaps a chance of a little blackmail because they said, no way. And in fact, one or two of them put up obstructions. So that by this time, I mean, we put up neon strips and flowers and all sorts of things to dress the arcades in. But on the day, they made it impossible. We needed uh, to find uh, two rooftops from which one or more of the minis could leap from one to the other over a street and th the possibility of shooting in the streets of Turin were denied to us because of the danger to the public below. Uh, Agnelli uh, offered the, his own factory streets uh, to Michael Dealey, and in fact, we did in the end shoot it there. I was always taught by the great Robert Siodmek that if you want something to look very high, you put the camera above it. I don't think Peter, let you rest in peace, but I don't think Peter had his camera high enough above the the action. So it didn't look what it should have looked. The rooftop jump is famous, but for me very, still very disappointing. It should have been shot from above so that you could see the height, the separation between the top of the roof and the ground, and thus really 
felt the danger the drivers were, were going through. They weren't in fact in too much danger because they'd practiced so long on, on flat ground with a ramp and they knew perfectly well that they could make the distance unless something went wrong. I can't help thinking now that if I had a chance of doing it again, that at this tiny little bit I would, I would have made slow motion so that one could just savour this little mini flying through the air. But there you are, in life you can't always go back on things. There was a feeling that if the first mini hit the parapet, it would spin and bring the other two minis down with them, and it was a long way to the street. The problem was if something did go wrong, because at that time in Italy there was a law which basically exists, where anybody who causes a situation which results in a fatal accident is charged with manslaughter. And um, since I was the person in charge, I was the one who would be slipped into the Turin jail. I came to Turin, and the first, uh, the first shooting that I saw was the wolf sequence, which was shot in the hall where the Turin Motor Show is held. Well, the Blue Daniel sequence was um, really a, a sort of interlude, but before the final uh, getaway through the sewers. And uh, it, it was simply uh, uh, someone conducting the Blue Danube in, a, in an enormous ice rink and three police cars come out from behind the orchestra and the minis come in from the other end of the the ice rink, and they sort of waltz to the Blue Danube and, and then the minis make their escape and the police cars get stuck in the doorway. I, I, I saw some of the shooting and I thought, this can't possibly work. This is going to be terrible. I was wrong. I thought it was, uh, I thought it was absolutely wonderful. I adored it. And I was very, very sad when it was taken out. The sewer sequence was shot by Phil Ressler um, near Coventry, in a newly uh, being built new sewer. I certainly wouldn't have liked to have shot it in an existing sewer. Remy Julien was trying to achieve a, a complete circle, but he could not get enough speed out of the minis, or maybe just couldn't get enough speed on that surface to do a complete turn. The G-forces weren't enough, so he couldn't do the full circle that he wanted to do. It was meant to be a sort of wall of death thing. Um, might have done it with the motorcycle, but couldn't do it with the cars, sadly. Everything was going fairly well. I went, I did a, a run in the front of the Mini with Remy at first and um, had, uh, had him uh, bringing the car up to the roof and so on. That was fun. Then, we, when we came to shooting it, Remy hadn't quite got enough speed up to be able to, 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 be able to stick to the roof of the car, the roof of the sewer, as, as he tried to get it to turn. We did it once, the car came down on its lid. We did it a second time, the car came down on its lid. The third time it was going perfectly, but it hit a ledge we hadn't noticed in the roof of the sewer. It came down very, very hard on, her, on its lid and that was the end of the car, so we had to go home. Peter had a tremendously wild streak in him. I mean, he was the one that stood at the edge of that bus as those cars came hurtling into the coach. Nobody else would do it. And when Michael Dealey found out, the producer, he was fuming because the danger he was in, and if they'd lost Peter at that stage, it would have cost so much money. It really would have been terrible, but he was the one that would do that sort of thing. There was a feeling that Peter Collinson was attracted to danger, but I don't think that was true. I think he wanted to continually confront it uh, to prove, particularly to others, um, that he was up to the job of actually directing this movie. Uh, there were a lot of dicey moments in it, and he wasn't prepared to dodge any of them, either by faking shots or by, in some way, lessening them, lessening their, their, their potential for accidents. So he went at it. I remember the, the, the scene where the minis are thrown out of the van, one by one, and of course we had to shoot that uh, from the side of the mountain and also at the bottom of the mountain, 
and I volunteered uh, to be on one of the cameras at the bottom of the mountain. And I couldn't help reflecting at the time that, hey, this was rather an unwise thing to do in some ways because the, when the cars were they're thrown out of the van, uh, it, it was anybody's guess how they would fall and where, where they would finish up. And as the thing came hurtling down towards me, I remember, but you know, one was sort of preparing to run away, one way or the other if necessary. I couldn't help reflecting that in a previous film I had already been hit and taken to hospital uh, after being hit by a, a, an aeroplane, believe it or not. And I suddenly thought, I, I got away with that one. And it would be a bit, bit much now if the thing that finally flattened me was a mini. I was told that the insurers went white uh, when they saw the possibilities there were um, for claims. I wrote about four endings. Um, most of them were involved in three of them taking place in Geneva. So Geneva was always built in to the kind of script. And in fact, there are still um, references to Geneva in the current movie. And I wrote one where they get back to England and Bridger has done some deal with the, the Mafia and orders them to take the gold back to Italy. I didn't actually like any of the ends, I didn't think any of them worked. And I also had another thing up my sleeve, which I thought this picture was going to be successful. And I thought, if it is successful, we'll want to make a sequel to it. Not a remake, that's nonsense, but a sequel. And so I went off to Hollywood to sit down with Bob Evans, who was the studio head at the time, a very, very good studio head, and um, wanted to sit down, try and work out how we'd end this thing. And on the way, on the plane, in those days planes were very comfortable and pleasant, uh, I came up with an idea which was a cliffhanger, which would give the sequel thing, and at the same time make it a sort of challenging ending for the audience. And that's the ending we had. The ending that Bob Evans and Michael Dealey came up with um, was absolutely brilliant and I think it was predicated because what had happened on the mountain with chucking the the, the minis out of the the coach and the way they tumbled down the mountain that kind of was the beginning of an ending and therefore going to Geneva would have been just a, 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 you know, a scene too far. I thought it was rather a good idea and um, Norman Warwick and I uh, took a Pilatus plane and we flew around the Alps and we finally found a wonderful location, we thought. When Peter Collinson saw it, he said, you can't have that, I'm using it to shoot the confrontation with the Mafia. So fun. So we found another location. And this was really wonderful, it's a place called Cerasole. The road we shot on goes from nowhere to nowhere. Well, it doesn't go from nowhere to nowhere. It goes to one rather ghastly restaurant. What I didn't know was that every Sunday the Italians go out there, there are hundreds to eat, uh, to eat at that restaurant. Well, we shot on the Saturday, it was a brilliantly sunny day. And uh, on the Sunday, we were, uh, I was lining up, everything fine. The uh, Polizia Stradale, the traffic police had closed off the road. When I looked down to the, to, to the bottom of the hill, there were hundreds of cars. And the Italian said, why can't we go to the, up to the restaurant? You can't sit there the police. Why? Because they're making un film inglese. What? So they tore down the, the, the barriers and they went up and that was that. And uh, I, I, I tried to stop them, impossible. So that was my lovely sunny day, gone. The next day it rained. The following day it rained. And it rained for two or three weeks. And every day the snow line went, came and down another 250 feet, another 250 feet. And when I came to shoot the end sequence, the last, my last shots, there was snow on the road which we had to sweep off. The brief was to write a song that made uh, the Italian Riviera look irresistible. You know, just one of those gorgeous, sunny, tinted songs, you know, that you hear, Neapolitan songs. You think, oh my God, I'd love to be in Italy now. 
So it was an open air type romantic melody we were looking for. Well, I was a sort of a double act with Matt at the time because, you know, we had quite a bit of success together. We had quite a few songs that, that were, were hits and people used to come to me and Matt to sing and write songs. And I think it came from Michael Dealey, actually, originally. He thought putting me together with Quincy was a good idea. But I, writing the song, it was not as easy as, as you think because uh, the kind of song that was required was a very simple song. I remember Quincy Jones thinking, what have I written here? Because it seemed so uncomplicated for, for Quincy. He was used to writing for Count Basie and Lena Horne and Frank Sinatra. All we wanted was a simple little Italian tune, which was very hard to come by. I remember sitting with him in his flat in Marble Arch. And we both stared at the piano for ages because we just wanted a little sing-along song and he would play very complicated chords. And uh, anyway, I, I remember going out for I said, I'll come back in a few hours. And I, he came back with, with a tune, it was like four notes, the first four notes. So I gave him the title On Days Like These, which sort of suggested a sunny Italian day. And he said, yeah, on days like these. And, an hour or so later, it happened. But it was like pulling teeth to begin with. Questi giorni quando vieni il bel sole La 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 Matt Moreau loved that tune, and he loved the lines in it. I don't know why he loved it particularly, but he loved the line, while your eyes plays, while your eyes played games with mine. He always loved that line. And he sings it as if he loves it. You can tell it's a very heartfelt rendition. While your eyes play games with mine, days like these. After the shooting was finished, the, um, I was asked to uh, go to dinner in Knightsbridge with Michael Caine, Michael Dealey and Quincy Jones had been flown in to do the music. And I remember Michael Caine in this very crowded and very fashionable restaurant uh, singing into Quincy Jones' ears, My Old Man's Dustman. And uh, Quincy was nodding to the beat, um, which must have been quite unusual, uh, this particular type of, 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 of song. And Michael went through it and then got to the end and went, da-da-da-da, da 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 brown bread. The song Get a Blooming Move On was really just one of those silly things that, that Quincy would say to me, what does apple and pears mean, uh, the apples and pears? And I said, steers. And then I gave him a whole list of things, you know, peck and rye means tie, you know, and daisy roots means boots. And he just used to fall about because he comes from America where they have no idea what this was. And he said, well, let's do a song like that. It was Quincy's idea, actually. He said, what a great idea, let's string them all together. Which was very easy for me, because I come from the East End of London, where people, you know, speak like that. So uh, it really took no time at all to finish that song. I believe that Quincy's involvement made the picture work. Well, the whole last sequence, last 25 minutes, was very patchy. It was shot by different people, Phil and Peter Constant, at different paces. And it, it didn't really do what it had to do. And Quincy stitched it together by very, very, very clever musical arrangement. And he deserves great credit for that. Now more than ever, the Italian job enjoys huge popularity, a fact that would have made Peter Collinson very proud. He continued to work in movies right up until his death. Uh, Peter wasn't quite 41 when he died. He died very, very young. We were all living in Hollywood, Beverly Hills, and uh, he had just finished one movie and was going for his checkup for insurance for another movie that he was starting. Uh, he came home from the doctor and said to me, he just wants me to hang on, he wants to ring me about something, but neither of us had any idea there was anything wrong. 
And when they did ring him, they said they couldn't insure him because they'd found he had cancer quite badly. And we were quite stunned because he actually wasn't ill. He wasn't ill at all. We'd spent the year before that in Australia with William Holden making the Earthling and uh, he was in fine form, looked well. I don't know whether it was being told he had cancer or whether the cancer really was desperately fast. But from the day he was told, he lived 12 weeks and died in St John's Hospital. Not quite 41. Too early. The Italian job is enduring because it is so uh, intrinsically British, English. Try putting your foot down, Tony. They're really getting rather close. It somehow has come to represent the 60s, even though it is a kind of fantasy version of it. It's the lad's film. <laughs> I think the film is enduring because it has a, a star who is still, to this day, very, very popular, perhaps never been more popular. Mr Bridger. I've got a job lined up. It came at a time when the English films were pretty awful. And this was something special. Typical, isn't it? I've been out of jail five minutes and already I'm in a hot car. We never, ever thought that it would become the film that it has become. It's about a bunch of losers, isn't it? And the British have always loved people who don't quite make it. You're meant to use your brakes, Chris. Te terribly sorry, Charles. Tell Bridger this is a foreign job to help with this country's balance of payments. It has a sort of a very English sense of humour pervading it. There's the, there's the cheekiness, really, of all the people involved. Wait till you see them Italian birds. Aren't they big? I like them big. <laughs> big! Music is still playable, which is rare for a 30-year-old film. This job is bigger than anything Bridge has done up until now. Charlie, you wouldn't even know how to spell big. How did you, sir? They've done it, Mr. Bridger. All the men are for you, sir. <laughs> They've done it. It's fun, and fun survives. This is the Self-Preservation Society, the Self-Preservation Society. Put on your arm and got some daisy roots, flash your MCD, wear your whistling flute. Lots of naughty dogs and cobblies here, look alive and get out of here. Get your skates on, mate, get your skates on, mate. No big around you, play respect tonight. Hey, drop your plates of meat. Right on the seat. This is the self-preservation society. The self-preservation society. 